Well, good evening and uh, welcome to this new edition of our Skyline Talks in front of the Chicago Skyline. Health is a concern we all share as individuals as well as society. Most of us reflect and care as patients, not few of our guests tonight also as medical doctors. However, the issues are complex and there are more stakeholders to be considered if we want to maintain the excellence, the accessibility and sustainability of our healthcare system. It is my pleasure and privilege to talk tonight to Dr. Verena Völter, a passionate internist and oncologist. During her clinical and executive business career in healthcare, she has built expertise in both the public and private sectors. She is an adjunct professor for Kellogg's Public Private Interface Initiatives at Northwestern University and the author of It Takes Five to Tango, From Competition to Cooperation in Healthcare. Thank you for being here, Dr. Folter, and talking to us. Shall we dance? Yes. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Consul General Reef, for this invitation. I really feel honored to be sitting here in this fantastic skyline, but still on Swiss premises. So this is a very unique moment. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Pleasure is all And thanks well. to the audience mm -hmm. for joining and listening. Um, it's a privilege to discuss this easy tango. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Allow me to start with a very personal question. Uh, since your early childhood, you have liked what most other people try to stay away from. The slightly bitter smell of antiseptic with undertones of the artificial fragrance contained in soaps and cleaners. <laughs> in other words, the smell of hospitals. So just as a disclaimer, I'm totally normal, so I don't have some, I'm not, like... No fetishism. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you're right. Mm -hmm. I think I feel I'm fortunate that I discovered my passion so early, and it, it's true. I was eight years old. My grandmother, who was a physician in, during the Second World War, and my auntie took me to a hospital. And I think I instantly, I entered this lobby, and I have the same feeling now, I don't say how many years later, but a few years later, um, of connectedness of belonging and this this deep feeling or let's say that today still I deeply care for patients but also for my fellow physicians because that was literally the day I decided to become a doctor mm -hmm. and today and I guess that's what we're going to talk about I really feel deeply with my fellow physicians in what is a broken system and I guess we'll dive into this later. Yes, with, with pleasure. Um, in your book you state that it takes five to tango and from the patient's point of view the key partner is certainly the healthcare provider, the doctor you trust, the doctor we trust. Another key actor is pharma and biotech. You have worked in both environments what did motivate you to switch sides? Yeah, so I do have these two hearts and I, I really want to echo what you're saying. I mean, when we get to this issue, what is at the root cause of the broken systems, but we, and we tend to forget, no doctor, no care. So this patient-doctor backbone relationship in the tango for five, almost it's like the pair dancing in the middle and the others around. Mm -hmm. But personally, I have to say, I have these two hearts, so I have this, this hospital heart, I should say, but I love the business too. And I love to travel and I love to discover the world and that was unique in my 12 years biopharmaceutical industry experience. I was able to work in Korea and in Taiwan and mm -hmm. in the United States and in Europe and Middle East, so this, this was unique. And I have to say, I also like complexity. Maybe that's why I wrote the book. Oh, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I don't like the easy path. I like when it's really, really complicated. And I'm curious to find ways to connect the dots. And I think that's then what brought me to the Tango for Five. As a cancer doctor, of course, I was also on the search of better treatments 
for my patients, for our patients. I mean, we have phenomenal success in oncology. Uh, part of the success of a really good Tango for Five, great progress with new medicines and treatments for cancer patients. Mm -hmm. But it's not enough. I think it's probably never going to be enough until we cure. But we need better treatments and we need better cures. And that was a strong motivator to try out my pharmaceutical experience. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, now that we have touched upon two of the participants so far in this Tango of Five, who are the other three and who is conducting? Yeah, so the bad news, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is no conductor. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I mean, to disclose who the five are, I think what I'm really thinking is this value chain of patients receiving care, providers delivering the care, pharma to a large extent developing care. I mean, there's also academic drug research, and by the way, Kellogg and Northwestern is having a great discovery lab as well, but generally speaking, 80, 90% comes out of pharmaceutical. Then we have payers paying for the care, and policy setting the ethical and regulatory framework because it's all about human beings. So it really mm -hmm. is one of the closest, toughest regulated industries that we have. So I think those are the other three that join the dance. And mm -hmm. the trick is, and often I get this, the, one of the first questions, like where, Verena, tell us, who's the conductor? And we're like, well, there is none. We have to figure this mm -hmm. out. And these five have to figure it out themselves. And so the good news is that there's a playbook on how to coordinate whenever there's opposing interests. So it's based on the Harvard Negotiation Project. It's a big part of my book because I'm really bringing this into healthcare. How can we reconcile opposing interests, like a health insurance and a hospital administrator and a patient? I mean, couldn't be more opposing, but there are ways to do it. And we all have to adopt that skill set. And then what we do together we have to adopt a totally different incentive system. We call it value-based healthcare, so it's really incentivizing and rewarding, not the services and the products and the procedures, because what you do with this, you create expectations of products, procedures, and services, and that drives cost. But in that equation, there is no vocabulary around the patient. And all it does, that what we call it fee-for-service system, it actually produces a pressure to produce the same old, and that is driving cost. And I know we're gonna, you're curious to talk about cost. Everybody wants to talk about cost. <laughs> but let me add to what you have said a, a quote from your book, which also shows that it's good to learn from beyond the sector you are working in. There you wrote, uh, there's much that healthcare can learn from other industries when it comes to value. The customer experience and learning how to listen to the customer. Mm -hmm. However, isn't it ironic that we have to refer to the consumer goods and business world to help us refocus on who our ultimate customer is in healthcare, the patient. Absolutely, and I think this is one, and I'm speaking totally to myself, also from my pharmaceutical times. I think we all actors developed a totally skewed view on who our customer is. We think of the customer of the person who buys my product or my surgery. Mm -hmm. And that is true, it's an important customer. And pharma, like the prescribing doctor, is one of my biggest customers, but it's not the only one. So by the way, the doctor actually doesn't buy my drug, it's actually the pharmacist or it's the hospital administration, or it's the payer behind, or all the zillion payer intermediaries that are behind. The FDA is behind, the HHS is behind. So I think the one word you haven't heard in this is the patient. Mm -hmm. And I think this is linked to our wrong incentives, because if the incentives are on money, we do what brings us money, because that's what we are paid for, it's very natural. So we won't, the, the trick with the Tango for Five is that no single player has the means and the empowerment to change anything. The hospital alone can't do it. The, the best health insurance in the world with the best intentions alone can't do it. The FDA alone has no clue. The HHS has no clue what healthcare is about in the first place. So we need to, you see what I'm getting to. You require everybody to cooperate to change the system. Yeah, 
already almost anticipated my, my next question is how do you transform those yeah. these silos uh, we have seen into an open dance floor uh, who really plays and who follows the music yeah so I think it's going back to there is no conductor and we have to do it all together let me let me uh, pause again I think on the what so the what is really that transformation and shift of incentives from paying for services in a transactional manner to paying for outcomes and results that mm -hmm. matter. And to very practical example, a patient with a hip replacement, today the doctor gets paid, the hospital gets paid, fine. Nobody looks ever if the patient can walk again. And we have it in our family, 85 year old, exactly that story she is invalidated today, two years later, she cannot ever walk again. There is no penalty in the system. Nobody looks at the patient. So that's what we do with the new system. And on an uplifting note, there's plenty of examples where this is actually working, where you measure outcomes, let's say diabetes patients. So the patient together with the caregiving team and the cross-functional team, social workers, family, patient, the ophthalmologist, the nephrologist, everybody you need around that patient. They agree on what is the outcomes we need for this patient together mm -hmm. with the patient. Mm -hmm. And then it's being paid for if these outcomes, let's say the glucose level, blood sugar level after a year or two years, um, everybody gets paid for. And then there are even clever systems in the Netherlands, for example, if you're doing better, the system gets a bonus. And if you get worse, you get a malus. But everybody shares that, actually. Mm -hmm. So you think, oh my god, this will mm -hmm. never happen in my place. So the good news is it does, even in the city, like systems like Oak Street Health, um, Intermountain Health, uh, Jefferson University, in the Netherlands, uh, but also in Switzerland. We have the first contract that was signed uh, not even 12 months ago between a health insurance, two hospitals, to do exactly that. There's not unanimous applause for this because it's tough. And the trick for the Tango for Five is everybody will need to give in a little bit from the bargaining power to eventually everybody will gain more and value more. The problem is there's a time delay. Mm -hmm. And it takes a ton of time to do that. But the good news is really, and I think that's where I really encourage for those who are interested to get that going in their practice. There's a ton of examples in the book, but also in the podcasts we do um, to share this experience. Mm -hmm. I want to come to this cost issue, but just to, to clarify the example of the hip replacement. If I understand well, it was not medical malpractice, no. but it was most questionable that hip replacement was really necessary, it was, but the success rate yeah. was more than questionable. It's a, it's a fantastic question, particularly because we have a bunch of doctors in the audience and maybe listen. Mm -hmm. So, of course, in the beginning, there's this fear of, you know, when you measure quality, and I think probably the word alone, there are alarm clocks where people say, oh God, another quality initiative, you know, from my hospital administration, get out of my way which is true, because if this is not built on changing the outcomes and paying for the outcomes, it is a nonsense <coughs> initiative. But back to your question, so yes, there is this fear, oh my God, you know, the physician will be put in the spotlight on the results of the surgeries. And I give, let me give you one example. The Martini Clinic in Hamburg has been implementing this around um, uh, urology, uh, particularly prostate cancer and, and other uh, urology diseases. They've been doing this for 15 years. Absolutely, there's a learning curve. In the first years, there was exactly that fear and doctors shying away. So I think this does not work without a culture change mm -hmm. and a mindset mm -hmm. change and creating an atmosphere of trust where this is not perceived as a top-down, yet another initiative by hospital CEO XYZ, but really in a tango for five where you, everybody has equal voice and rights and then you move along this journey together and you don't, the, the trick with value-based healthcare is this is not about a single patient, it's about population mm -hmm. of patients. Mm -hmm. So you will be measured, you know, it's not Mrs. Smith who has a problem with the hip replacement, that will not be a malice, but it will be really the population of this. So it's quite complex in the implementation, but it's easy in the comprehension. And the good news is this can be done, but it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. 
I guess there we have already a wonderful spark for the Q and A afterwards. I'm sure. But let's get uh, to to the cost issue, which has been uh, mentioned about a month ago. Top legislative leaders in Indiana have put hospitals and health insurers on notice that they need to work together to lower out of control cost of health care or lawmakers will don surgical guns and wield their legislative scalpels to do it for them. When we look at the US, uh, health uh, healthcare spending grew 9.7% in 2020, reaching 4.1 trillion or $12,530 per person and year. As a share of the, of the nationals GDP, health spending amounted to 19.7%, almost 20%. In Switzerland, the healthcare expenditure per capita has reached $9,800 or 12% of GDP. So healthcare cost has become an urgent concern in most OECD countries. Is the level of spending an indicator for the quality of the healthcare system? Probably not. So there's, there's one additional number I want to add into the mix. So U.S. in 2020 healthcare budget, four trillion U.S. dollars. I mean, I can't even comprehend that number, but it is 20%. So meaning on $100 GDP in this country, 20 are spent on healthcare. Mm -hmm. Now, another number you should remember is that up to 50% of that money is wasted. Yet, the, the numbers I want to throw in is longevity. So one parameter and surrogate could say, well, if it's very costly, but maybe our people live longer, actually, and healthier, and then maybe it's a good thing. It's good, you know, invested money despite the waste. The problem is, in the United States, longevity started declining since 2015. It is 79 years now for 10,000 bucks per person spent. In Switzerland, it's 83 years for about, what did you say, six, 7,000? dollars per person spent. So there is no correlation. And we are coming back to what I said earlier. If you do not change the incentive system and the reward, and you can't and you do not get rid of the waste and the inefficiencies that occur in all those silos, because that's the thing right now, these five dancers, they all act in silos. And basically, where some people ask me, where's the waste going? Well, it is disappearing in the cracks in between those silos because you duplicate tests, because hospital A doesn't talk to hospital B, because, mm -hmm. you know, all the different reasons, and that leads to a decrease in quality, to an ever increase in cost because of these duplications and waste. And then, you know, software doesn't speak to another software in another hospital down the street. And so all of this is like raising costs. So it is the combination of switching our incentive model to value-based healthcare and measure and pay for outcomes, introduce digital healthcare, have the fourth industrial revolution finally enter healthcare, mm -hmm. and you know, look at what hospitality does, you know, does, Apple does great things, why do our computers still not talk to each other in healthcare? So digitally powered plus a, a culture, mindset, and skill improvement of healthcare leaders to adopt the playbook of interest-based negotiation or collaboration that does exist so that we can work together without a conductor. There's, there's a playbook and then we tend to believe that healthcare is focusing entirely on the patients. At the same time, it seems that they have not really any power to promote changes to patients. Are they the ball which is kicked around in this game of diverting interests? Or can we all, mm -hmm. also as patients, contribute to improvements? Yeah, absolutely. It's true that if you look at an old system where money drives and the incentives, the patient has zero bargaining power. Like in the chain, you know, but I think this is also, by the way, where digital is improving empowerment, you know, with remote patient monitoring. And I think the beauty of something like Oak Street Health with value-based healthcare, they're really stratifying their patients to 
those who are very, very sick, who need a different care, but maybe a 40-year-old with a single disease of hypertension, you know, they don't need to come to the hospital all the time. They are actually happy if they have a device and they can do telehealth from their office, etc. So I think there's ways where patients can step up, take on more of the mobile devices and the remote patient monitoring that does exist for those where it's appropriate. And I think where we want to get at, and that's true for the patient, but for all of the five, the payers and the doctors and, and, and the policymakers, every single person together collaboratively in the sum of projects will move the needle. Mm -hmm. So we'll say as a patient, and I have actually done that after, and shame on me after I wrote the book, I'm like, have I spoken to my doctor? And like, I, I'm like, I'm writing this book and I figure my GP, he's actually pen, using pen and paper in a fax machine. I'm like, wait a second, I should ask my doctor, why, why are you using pen and paper? And why didn't I do it before? Because I didn't dare, I didn't have the courage. I'm like, oh my God, I'm not gonna ask my doctor. Well, you know what, I did it. And I, it opened a fantastic conversation. So I think every patient can do that. You can ask your health plan, you can ask your doctor, have a conversation. This morning I recorded a, a podcast and, and actually down the street with Northwestern University in the pathology department and somebody said, well, we have this great test, but we can't get a foot in the door with a pair. I'm like, well, you know, try, find the right person, you're on social media, connect with somebody. It is this one-to-one -one in this kind of circle back to your initial question, what brought me to healthcare in the per first place. Let's not forget our sense of belonging and the connections, and that's why we're here, to connect the dots, and let's not forget that every single person together, you know, every single project in the sum, we will move the needle. We've seen it in other places mm -hmm. that it works. Thank you. Uh, being just a patient, not having a full understanding of, of, of the issues. There was one terminology I didn't fully understand, the Oak Street model. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a two sentence to, to yeah. explain what that is? So you may know Oak Street Health is a or system for, Health, yeah. is for the elderly. Um, and actually they have a, so one way in value-based healthcare you typically um, stratify by disease. So diabetes patient or uh, breast cancer patients, for example. And then you build your multidisciplinary team around, you build in the health plan, et cetera, and, and you, you, you build those outcomes and measurements together. Oak Street Health is not based on a disease because elderly typically have what we call multi-morbid conditions. So they have diabetes and Parkinson's and they don't sleep well and they have depression. So you can't have like a multifunctional team for all these diseases, it doesn't work. So the way they do it very simplistically, have four strata, and it sounds very simple, too simple to be working, but it does work. The very sick, the sick, the mildly ill, like the 40 year old with the hypertension, and really those that are more in the prevention case maybe, you know, that really have occasional uh, diseases. And then you can actually tailor the intensity of the care very differently. I'll give you one example also. They did a study on hypertension. Actually, there were patients who missed their appointments. What was the reason? Actually, these patients couldn't afford the cap to go to the hospital. So A, they introduced remote patient monitoring to say, listen, you actually don't have to come every time, so we can save the cost. And then for those who really are critically ill, those 4% in their population, they're actually paying for the cab ride. But they don't need to pay the cab ride for 100% of their population. But they're really tailoring, so in a very pragmatic way, and they have actually let, I mean, the numbers, the satisfaction of patients and the providers has increased. The outcomes have improved. Mm -hmm. Actually, those hypertension cases, for example, are better controlled now. And their cost structure has become better. And they completely switched their system to pay for outcomes. And they have 40% less hospitalization rates for their patients. So that's a local example. Thank you very much. I guess I have a last question before I would like to open for, for our q and A. I I guess you have already touched with what you have said now on, a, on an important aspect of that, because what is your vision for innovative, affordable, and sustainable healthcare? Yeah, I think it's those three things. Um, a digitally powered 
collaborative, value-based healthcare system that is akin to the 21st century and really modernize healthcare like we have modernized electronic, hospitality, financial sector. We can do that in healthcare and I really call for action on every single individual. It's up to us to make it happen. I will be relentless to share the positive examples because it does work. We have all the tools. We don't need to invent them. We need more creativity and courage to take the next step. So for the digital part, the, the hospital administration has to take money in their hand. Absolutely. And the doctors have to accept this new way of working, which should actually make it easier and and I want to right away plug a caveat. Our biggest roadblock and hurdle in our own way is the finger pointing. Mm -hmm. The second we start, but mm -hmm. they have to do, won't work. Yes, name the problem, absolutely. We have to, because otherwise, if we don't understand the facts, if we don't understand where the money sinks, if I don't know in my hospital and in my environment, where does the money disappear, where's the waste? Of course, we need to, we are doc I mean, many of us as doctors, we need to get the diagnostics right. But try to stay away from the finger pointing because that is where the dead end is. And I think, yes, then Germany, for example, with the last administration already, they put forward a digital health law. They implemented it in 12 months. In 12 months, a new law in Germany, <laughs> bureaucracy. And then they actually put forward grants and say, over the next three years, every startup that comes with a new idea on how to modernize healthcare with digital, we match it one-to-one -one with a government euro. But you have to get this done in three years. I can tell you, these grants, they went in like nothing. They're, the money is all given. Now they have to implement in the next 24 months. Mm -hmm. This is a machine. <clears throat> What's going on right now in Germany is absolutely outstanding. But the FDA also has created a new, actually, a division for digital health. But I'm always surprised, it's very little known. The FDA actually does open house visits where you can go and discuss with the FDA. Can you imagine? Nobody goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, uh, I guess also as countries, we should and have to learn from, in this case, from friends and neighbors, uh, since Germany is doing such an excellent job in that, uh, in that field, uh, we should really look into that. But that's the moment where I would like to open the floor for questions, remarks, doubts. Solutions. Solutions. <laughs> Maria, thank you for uh, inviting me to be here. Thank you for writing the book. In a very important conversation, a couple of questions. So, you, you mentioned healthcare is 20% of the GDP. If you had to divide it uh, between industry and, let's say, the dollars that went to healthcare to the providers, how does that break down? Yeah. I'm, so I'm looking over at JP and I'm thinking about this. It's all in him, like that. <laughs> people that cost 10 cents at Home Depot, but a thousand dollars for the hospital. So, the the very uh, legitimate question is 20 percent of GDP. How are they distributed in the in the whole field of uh, healthcare? Yeah, so that, that, that was actually part of my six months research to the book because I started, I guess, with that question, like, what the heck, where's all this money? And that's why I'm saying we actually don't have a money issue in healthcare. Maybe the cynic would say we have too much money maybe in the system. The, our problem is it's totally in the wrong place. So to your question, so what I found is that the single most largest entity in that pie is the hospital sector with one third. And that is consistent over time and it's consistent over geographies. It's the same in the United States than in Taiwan, than in Israel. And it makes sense because it's legacy, it's in stone, it's you, you just don't move a hospital from A to B in a year. I mean, you, you know, the, it's hard to drive that change, but still it's there. And I think we do see that 
I, when I started my fellowship and my residency in the internal medicine ward, my attending told me, it's like, oh, no, 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 don't dis discharge this patient because we need to keep the beds. It's like, oh, no, no, thrombosis, two weeks, two weeks in the hospital. So, of course, in many places, this is Tempe Passati, we don't do this anymore, but guess what? In many places, it's still true. So I think that move for the, to, for the hospital sector to reinvent themselves to what you guys are doing, hyper-specialized care, episodic care, pandemic care, et cetera, absolutely this is where we need hospitals for. And I think there's a lot of work in modern hospitals that are doing this right now. You asking industry, so the, what, with my past 12 years in the pharmaceutical industry, I was interested, it was like, what is that true proportion? And it's actually interesting. It is 10 to 20%, which you could argue is still high. And, and I think pricing is an interesting conversation. You were talking about the screws and I think, but there is actually a whole sector I spoke about value-based healthcare, which is more like the medical component, but there's a whole, um, not only research, but practical on value-based procurement, on value-based pricing, fantastic initiatives going on right now. And some of the health systems are actually starting to pilot these things. And then, which doesn't really make sense in the 100% of the pie, but what I did find, the numbers on the waste is 20 to 50%, and it's consistent over across geographies and over time. And we have to get hold of this waste part. You know, we, and we have to address all of the parts. But I think this is where, uh, I should say, where digital comes in. Our problem today is that we can't measure a full cycle of care. If you say from a patient from A to Z for whatever, you know, um, multiple sclerosis, for example, you know, what in over 10 years, that patient, we have no means to measure this because system A doesn't talk to system B and you know, all, this, all the problem we have. So I think we also have to work on this so that we can really find ways where to find the inefficiencies and this is where digital comes in. Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, you're talking about the waste. Could you be more precise, please? Where, where do you see the waste? Give it some examples of, of waste in the, in the system. Yes. It's probably every single thing we do, <laughs> I guess there is waste. But to be practical and break it down back to the patient. So, you know, if I'm going now skiing, it's winter, I go to the mountains, I go skiing, I break my leg, um, and I go to the local hospital and I get an x-ray and I get a blood, a blood draw. Uh, and they say, oh, this is too complicated. We need to ship you to, you know, university hospital. Then we call the helicopter. So the hospital down the road, they can't read that. Best case, they get a CD room with the packed pictures. They can't read that CD room because they have a different software. They, um, the, the lab results were printed on paper, so it got lost. They, they, they have to do the lab again. Then, you know, they talk to the anesthesiologist in front, of, uh, ahead of the surgery. Uh, then that person, you know, still was using pen and paper. Next day, they can't find the notes. And I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit, but maybe not really. So I think there's a lot of duplications because of, we call it in the jargon, interoperability issues, because all these systems don't talk to each other. But of course, there's also a culture issue. You know, as physicians, do we really trust that hospital down the road? They're not as good as we do. We have the better MRI machine. My, I trust my radiologist and not the one down the street. And by the way, they lost the shipment, or then we go to diagnostics. You know, we have fantastic academic center here, but then if you're a referred patient, and then the biopsy samples from the previous diagnostics four weeks ago, they can't find it, or they have to, so it's repetition, redundancy, lack of system support that is driving a lot of these costs. Then in terms of just the last point on drugs, so pharmaceuticals. When I was in pharma, for each product and one dollar I sold my pill for, I got 50 cents in my pocket. The other 50%, 50 cents, nobody knows where they disappear. That's what I said, in the cycle of <coughs> care, we can't really say where all the money sinks. Mm -hmm. And they are, seized, they are actually people who write theses about this, where, where the money goes. 
Well, of course, in different countries we have also different healthcare systems. And now, when we take countries with with a monopole by the state, mm -hmm. uh, like Canadian provinces, for example, where no private insurance has been or still is not uh, allowed, this seems to be a more Mm, slower system to adapt. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there might be an advantage since mm -hmm. it is under mm -hmm. one umbrella that this could also be a model for, for, for change. How do you see those uh, different two, two different or at least two different models? Yeah, and I think, and we haven't spoken about this, I really want to encourage for the interested reader mm -hmm. Dr. Zekas Emanuel's book. It, it, is, it, is, it is really the Bible. Uh, he speaks about 11 different countries there is no answer to the question which country has the best health care. What he does come forward is with seven different dimensions where you can maybe compare. And, and that's where I'm getting at. So it depends really, of course, it depends on things like purchasing power of the country, the political system, uh, the culture, but particularly what does actually a country value. So the United States, for example, absolutely values innovation above all. And thanks mm -hmm. God they do. Because in terms of pharmaceutical and therapies, yes, the innovation is coming out of this country. It is true. And it, there is a reason. It's not just because yet it's in our culture. The incentive system is in favor that this works, etc. <clears throat> Other countries, like Switzerland, favor universal coverage. So every resident, you don't even have to be a citizen, but everybody who's starting to work in Switzerland must undergo a health plan subscription within four weeks. Otherwise, you get kicked out of the country. Can you imagine here in the United States? <laughs> uh, how wonderful would that be? Um, so I think it, the trick here is healthcare also is over politicized. My experience, you know, having worked and lived in this country for, for close to 15 years now, I got accused personally when I started talking about this, like, oh, you're a communist. I'm like, really? I've never voted anything close to communism, but maybe, okay. So it's very, so I think sometimes we're saying, could we leave people in healthcare alone, the five to tango, and let them figure it out and don't over politicize it? And I think that would help a big deal mm -hmm. already. Of course, mm -hmm. there, none of us can really change that, but, but it is to be cognizant of it sometimes helps to understand. So I think it is not necessarily the universal coverage, which is the holy grail for everything, because I can tell you there's a big chapter about Switzerland in this book. We have tons of issues in Switzerland, but not everything is bad. There's a ton of good too, but it's hard to compare one or the other. You really need the package of, of everything. Mm -hmm. Coverage is, is important, but innovation is important too. Mm -hmm. You said, of course, innovation, that's the United States, and thanks God it's here innovation. I'm paid to add that Switzerland is the second largest foreign investor in research in the United States, small Switzerland, and the good part of this research money goes into health. So there we have a uh, shared, uh, shared contribution. But please, other, other questions? I've been 30 years in healthcare. And when I started my career, the healthcare system was broken. We could have had not as elaborate, but we had the same analysis that we can't go on. And we, 30 years later, we made it worse. And one thing we did is because we tried to regular, fix the system by regulations. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is not only to you, but to our political representatives here. How can we get the regulations out of the system again? and get, find simple solutions. Um, so leave your five actors to actually run their own play rather than going by the playbook of our lawyers. Yeah. So gentlemen's agreement instead of regulation by the government. Yeah, no, I think, um, and I, 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 I've been very close to this compliance and safety piece, you know, in pharmaceutical industry where it was, we were part of the problem or we are part of the problem um, because there has been abuse. And we, we all know, remember the thalidomide story, the Contagan story in the, in the 50s, 60s with, with, you know, the birth defects because of so-called sleeping pill for pregnant women and, and, you know, it wasn't that safe. And now we're like in this overswing of over-regulation. Um, 
but I have to say, only saying the regulator or the lawyer it is short-sighted because we're all part of the, the issue. What I'm, if I think about the regulator in Switzerland, for example, the, the, the BAG, the Bundesgesundheit, uh, Amt für Gesundheit, they have a fantastic strategy. It, it's called BAG Health 2030. It stipulates all the right things. It is totally not known. Because we, have, we work in silos, one doesn't talk to the other, we don't dare bring it up. There are actually working groups where you can get engaged to drive a change. But it's not easy because two out of three times somebody smashes the door in front of your nose, you can't even enter the conversation. So it takes a lot of, yes, you know, as you say, you've been there 30 years, a lot of swallowing, a lot of, you know, how much resilience can you have? But, but I think what we see in smaller systems, in countries, projects that I'm citing, that if you start implementing, and it all starts with, the, with correcting the incentives. And I think this is the nice equation from, that Michael Porter put forward at Harvard 20 years ago, old stuff, nothing new, value equal outcomes divided by cost. So what ha what's happening, and we all have 10 stories to tell of yet another cost-cutting initiative in where we work. The only thing it does, it drives further cost because if you do it in isolation, if you do not work on the outcomes and improving the outcomes and the health that matters to your patients, you, you, go, you continue to go down that dead end. But again, on a positive note, there are initiatives, there are pilots, and I encourage all of you to look around your own workspace, what's going on, and, and find uh, like-minded people to engage in the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I guess we have time for two more questions, please. Yes, thank you. Yeah. But I loved your book. I think I'm hearing a sequel, though, the six Ps, throw in politicians. <laughs> uh, but what this makes me think of is that multi-party negotiations are challenging, a bit of a juggling act. But it sounds like the way that we can rise all boats is to focus on patient outcomes. Sounds like that's the way. But what's the motivation there for the cultural shift? Yeah. Because what I struggle with is at the end of the day, money talks. Yeah. And how do we change these incentives? You know, what's that? You know, because not everyone's going to agree with that incentive change. So how do we motivate that? That's what, but that's where I'm struggling. So the motivation for change, and I think that comes down to probably, and you're an expert in behavioral science, deep down in our psychology, when does a human being change behavior, right? We, we need to have some kind of pandemic, some emergency in our lives that we move. And, and I'm a little bit cynical, or let, let me quote um, Stephen Clasco from Jefferson Health, he said, the hospitals that do not embrace that change will disappear. So I think it is how, how far you've, you feel the water drowning that will make you change. That, that's what we're seeing. If you look at the positive cases that have embarked on the change, that was their trigger for change. Because they had some vital emergency for survival that, that made them change. Or, on a more positive note, you had a couple of visionary leaders who come in. So certain things are top down. So you can't implement that change without the decision makers in the five piece. So you need the decision makers. You can't do it without the CEO. But the CEO alone, it doesn't work either. So you, they have that is the mindset shift um, where you, and I think there's a role for the 6P, and by the way, that's what I'm doing in my day job right now as the founder, so thanks for the segue. So, you know, for my 5P healthcare solution is sometimes you need either a mediator or you need somebody to work alongside you and the others to help with that glue to bring it all together. And because it's a skill, it's hard work, as you say, it's not something you can go on Monday, okay, let's do all of this this way. It's very complicated. You need to figure out in your own system how and which place do we start. But that is kind of the common denominator that we see from those projects and those geographies where, where it's working. Um, so it's a combination of sense of urgency, vital need for survival, and visionary leaders. 
that, that's at least what I have seen. Mm -hmm. It's going to rise from the dust. Last question, Dr. Jose. Thank you for this evening, by the way. And I love how you brought up every topic possible that we've all been curious mm -hmm. about. Uh, so I was very intrigued about what you discussed on digital health and like advances, but I was curious about your opinion, uh, since you have worked with the pharmaceutical sector as well, on advanced testing such as pharmacogenomics or like biomarker genetics. Because with those two as well, they bring about advances in health, but mm -hmm. at the same time, there's the cost, there's the politics, there's that. But those two tests help for patients, doctors, and hospitals to communicate. So I was wondering if you came across any of that uh, and how that's maybe been factored in, because it's such a big topic, and I know especially in Illinois and the Midwest, the politics is very active to get those to the people, but the cost is very high. Yeah. But it is one tool that can help the patient doctor and lessen sure. costs and advance the healthcare. And I think pre precision medicine is kind of is a is a is the holy grail, and but it's also a risk. So if you only do the most fancy diagnostic, but you don't actually have a a therapy to help for it or prevent an illness to occur, it is usually it's, it's only driving cost. So I think the trick is always the same. You have to link it back to improve outcomes. And much of it right now, of course, is still in clinical research. So I think this is where a, a true place right now is for a lot of these precision medicine and pharmacogenomic and diagnostic tests is to actually ask that question, how with that test can we improve outcomes? And we do that in a controlled setting and study the question. But in, in general practice, there might be, there are some markers that are already linked to improving outcomes and those make sense. You know, I'm thinking of breast cancer, I'm thinking of other things, prostate cancer maybe. I'm just, I'm an oncologist, so bear with me, that's what I know best. But um, so, so I think <laughs> like digital and like precision medicine, absolutely is the future. Innovation happens at the intersection of all these different things come together. But if we do this in isolation, disconnected from what is the outcome and the health results we want to introduce and, and induce in our population, they will just do the opposite. They will increase cost. And they do right, right now. So, <laughs> but, but, you know. Last question. Yeah, <laughs> and I think this is probably the question that moves us most at the moment. Is it one of the five to dance is the patient? And at the moment, we have a big, big problem with many patients in this country, or would be patients, who refuse to get vaccinated. I mean, uh, this innovation goes on for as long as people are prepared to accept this innovation. Coming back to the behavioral change, how do we change the behavior of those who don't get vaccinated to get vaccinated? Yeah. Because otherwise, the innovation that we have achieved great innovations in vaccine production do not really help us to get out of this, out of this circle. Yeah. This circle. So I want to actually, on that example, mention, because it's not largely known, the development of at least four vaccines against a novel virus in less than 12 months is unprecedented on this planet. We have never seen that ever before, and that is only because of a Tango for Five, across geographies. Development and approval. I mean, when I say development, available to yes. you as a patient. So until the end, across the seven hurdles, down to the patient. We have never seen this before. Usually it takes over a decade for a new product, it takes over a billion, and you need 10,000 molecules on the bench to get one drug to the patient. So here, I mean, this is designed precision medicine. This was a designed drug for this illness. We have never seen this. And to your question, why did this happen? Because there was an emergency. That was the kind of the, the that was letting the fire. Now I think what you're alluding to is very, it, what, what sparks in my mind is we, ha we have a trust issue. We have a deeply, the frustration is so deep with all the players and with society. I think the mistrust, for example, towards pharma is at an all-time high, but also the mistrust towards doctors, towards society, towards politicians. I mean, 
if I, you know, I was on vacation over the holidays, I was listening to people on the street waiting for my bus. Listen to the voice on what people are saying on the street. And A, they're confused. They don't understand. When do I test? I heard things like, oh, when I want to go and buy a blue jeans, I need to get a BCR that costs me 150 bucks. I'm never going to do this. I don't believe these people. I'm like, you know what? They don't do this on purpose. They have not understood. It's like, you know, we're, yes, we're professionals. We get it. But, you know, it's not easy for everybody. And then maybe for those who understand, you know, we need to have, we need to engage in a dialogue. We need to have that communication. Healthcare suffers from a terrible hierarchical culture. We know mm -hmm. it better. I'm the mm -hmm. doctor, you know, look even at the position sometimes, the doctor is standing, the patient is sitting, it's like, I tell you what to do. And so it's deeply ingrained, and I'm not saying this is the only answer, you know, and, and I don't want to politicize this here and have an anti-vax vax conversation. But what I do see is really, we need to invest on communication, we need to educate, we need to be collaborative, which means we're all on equal eyesight. It's not I know it better or you, don't, you know it less good. So I think opportunities for edu education, dialogue, engagement is all the same song of, hmm. of, a, of a tango for five. Dr. Walter, thank you so much for sharing some of your insights, hmm. for proposing solutions, hmm. for looking into the future, into a sustainable future of uh, healthcare in partnership with all the five dancers in the tango. And uh, I would add, relating to the last question, also encouraging some risk taking in healthcare. That's probably unavoidable. Thank you so much. Please join me in a round of applause. <clears throat>